All right, let's talk about safety. And specifically since we are dealing with welding processes and obviously lots of heat, you know, we have things like tiny little explosions technically happening and obviously the risk associated with that. You've got electricity going on all around you. You have, you know, flammable gases, you got open flames, you got combustion. Uh, what else do you have going on? You got toxic fumes. Can't spell toxic there apparently. Oh, toxic fumes. See, all this stuff is happening around during the process of several of the welding processes. And all these pose dangers. Ultraviolet radiation, UV radiation. So all of this stuff has to be, you know, you need to protect yourself from all these occurrences and all the things that factor into these, these cool processes that we use to make stuff actually can be hazardous to your health. So you have to be concerned with your safety, your situation, your safety equipment, and of course your safety procedures. You have to have things like PPE. It's a little acronym for personal protective or protection equipment, protective or protect, protection equipment, probably protective. And all these things include the things like your, your visor, uh, cover your your actual upper body clothing, your jackets, gloves, that sort of thing. Even your ventilation can be part of your PPE system. Which if you have any fabrication experience, you probably understand this already. But it is important, especially in the workplace because of safety standards, liability risk for the manufacturer, those kind of things. Um, and there's never, given a construction example, you know, a lot of folks have to wear hard hats, and if they're up on roofs, they have to have certain safety straps and that kind of thing. And people will get fired for not following these type of safety regulations because it's better on the company to fire somebody that's not doing what they're supposed to on safety than having to pay the liability bills if they actually get injured. So the same thing is true for your manufacturing and your welding side of things. Well, even in the architectural side, if you're not following the guidelines in your personal protection equipment, they're more likely to just fire you versus have to deal with the liability. Because insurance premiums are high enough as it is, and then if they have accidents, they just have to pay that much more, and lawsuits are incredibly expensive. So, as well as fees they have to pay the government regulators, such as OSHA and other kinds of safety standards, if they're caught not having these safety procedures and equipment in place. So let's take a look at some general guidelines. Okay, so zoom in a little bit here. Hit my little screen draw tool. All right, so all your personal protective equipment must meet your uh, OSHA 29 CFR regulations. Now it's not the only one, but it is one where OSHA, you know, is a part of the process, and they have lots of regulations to begin with. Then, of course, you got to have your safety glasses or goggles. But we went before, during, and after welding. Now, the safety glass, of course, the visors versus goggles, two different things. So depending on which process you're using, one or the other must be worn in the whatever particular process you're using. Here we go, your protective clothing made of fire-resistant material. Work boots, typically they're steel-toed for most manufacturing operations. Leather leggings, fire-resistant gloves, should be worn. Obviously, your insulating ability there is, is important to begin with. Pant legs without cuffs. Obviously, you're not wearing shorts when you're welding. I have seen that happen very, very poorly because of a uh, dude welding and uh, he was wearing shorts on like an old farm trailer. And he was in a kind of a funky position and he got basically a sunburn essentially on the inside of his legs and uh, was very uncomfortable for a while. Uh, so don't do that, wear your pants. You'll notice that they point out the synthetic materials like polyester uh, melt and easily burn, so you should never not wear a jumpsuit when you're welding, which probably not gonna be doing that anyway, but just saying. Moving on, one of our big, big deals, of course, is our helmets, your welding helmet. And even the helmets themselves typically will have to pass some type of certification to even be sold. Goggles, of course, with special filters or filters and glass required to protect against injury and exposure to ultraviolet and infrared rays. 
Filter plates meet the requirements of American national standards. We've seen this one before, ANSI. And you'll notice that ANSI has their Z87.1 practice for occupational and educational eye and face protection. So you don't really necessarily have to know all who has what standard, but you do have to understand that there are different groups. OSHA doesn't have them all, and there's other standards that have to be met. And some companies will even have their own standards that they set in place that are on top of these to begin with. These are sort of your minimum requirements. Companies will actually stack more layers of requirements to provide more protection. Now to get more specific, I got my little tool up here again. You know, with the those ANSI standards and going back on those filter levels, you know, you've got a number, you've actually got numeric quantifications for certain operations in terms of their shielding. Uh, arc welding at 75 amps, 200 amps is a number 10 shade, higher than that requires a number 12 shade, over 400 amps requires a 14 shade. So you'll know, see there's even factors for how much, you know, how, how powerful the process is for lack of a better term. Ear protection, obviously that's important in a working environment. Obviously we get some high level noises there and over time that can damage your hearing. And here's one of the big ones that people sometimes don't really think much about until they've been in there for too long, is the well ventilation. You know, the fact is, um, the ventilation, getting those fumes out is extremely important and uh, must be taken very, very seriously. Sometimes in shop situations, you don't get by with just opening a big door and getting enough ven ventilation. Now you'll notice that they talk about air movement across the body, not from in front or from behind. There is preference into how the ventilation works and typically updraft ventilation is preferred. Which means, you know, if someone's sitting there on a table throwing an arc down, you know, we want, and here's their head and their mask, we want the ventilation to be going this way and get the fumes out of there. We don't want the fumes to be blowing this way or this way in the overall process. We want a ventilation upwards in most designs. Moving on. Certain types of processes involving certain types of materials, for example, your brass bronze, galvanized steel, metal painted, lead based paint, special ventilation has to be added in there or the person has to wear, well, and or the person has to wear a respirator. You see the fact is galvanized steel, for example, lead especially, this stuff is toxic. And when the welding process is used, even cutting processes are used in some of these materials, you have these very, very toxic fumes. And so ventilation isn't always enough. Sometimes a respirator to filter out that those materials from your breathing is obviously very crucial. And check this out. You're in a confined space. Let's say you're doing some field work or in a tight little spot, working in an inside a tank, maybe repair work. You know, there's actually procedures for safety that have to be involved. For example, you may have to have a standby person, uh, guard openings, proper ventilation, obviously. Sometimes you can't do that in repair work. You have to simulate that with uh, you know, fans or that kind of thing. Um, oxygen checks and other kind of requirements. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into the, to the non-standard environment that is still addressed. Look, they even have specifics for what, what welding requirements are for silos or trenches. So someone has actually written up rules on all this. So another one that you have to be aware of is, you know, materials that have actually been previously used, for example, that you're going to be providing repair work. So, you know, people oftentimes can bring in scrap metal to be used for a lot of different things. You can be people bring in tanks to be repaired and you have issues here where you may be cutting in or welding on a barrel or tank that may have had gas or petroleum products in it or some other type of material that once the welding occurs could create combustion or more toxic fumes than you're even aware of so cleaning and the proper cleaning of a material and sort of flushing a, a tank or barrel is incredibly important and so before you even start, you need to determine what the substance was in the container before you do any work. And that often brings up the topic of the MSDS sheets or the, the data sheets. MDS forms are oftentimes associated with materials and products. They show thing, all kinds of safety components to them. And it's well worth your time to look at the MSDS 
because you may not re realize what you may be dealing with. Now we run into this a lot on the educational side when we deal with uh, lab space, chemistry labs, uh, even um, cleaners and solvents, that these data sheets, which are supposed to be on site with the product and really available, are super, super important. Now when someone brings in an old barrel from a farm or something, you don't really know. And that is where you have to really exercise some good judgment about whether or not you're going to work on something of this nature. But if a product comes from a manufacturer, they'll typically have an MSDS sheet on the container itself or have available with the container. A little site information, make sure you know where the nearest fire extinguishers are if you bring them with you or if you're on a site or in someone else's facility. And of course, make sure that these things operate. Now, we don't go into how to check fire extinguishers, but I'm sure your company or where you're working for can provide those. There's a lot of different types. Um, that you can get in. There's actually the water jet tanks and of course your typical sprinklers and even those have different grades and applications for different types of combustion. Clearly don't weld or create sparks near flammable materials and keep your sparks and flame away from your oxygen cylinders and hoses because you know whether you realize or not oxygen is an explosive type of thing. You know if we would actually be breathing in pure oxygen in our world, we would also be running the risk of blowing ourselves up all the time. Very flammable stuff. So like I said, some of this stuff is common sense and you know, even the common sense stuff we don't always think about. Now there's always some catch-all statements that uh, companies and manufacturers and operators will rely on. They'll say, okay, make sure everything's installed according to the National Electric Code, which is hundreds of pages. So, you know, it's one of these catch-alls where they'll say make sure all your equipment is done a certain way or meets these standards and you know it's a way of covering all the liability but it's important that obviously we don't install equipment incorrectly and of course obviously we don't do arc welding in wet or damp areas because of electrical discharge or you know killing a person with electrical short circuit so having gone through that there's just a lot of stuff to be concerned with in terms of safety. And it's important for us to apply that before we even get started with a process. Um, and different processes involve different risks. Obviously, if we're doing something with arc welding, you know, there's a possibility of electrical shock involved. And uh, which is not always the case for all the other processes. Brazing, for example, doesn't necessarily involve electricity. So, you know, we have the same amount of risk. But I do want to take a moment or two to show you some other examples and let's take a look at this for a second. So a quick internet search will bring up for PPE or equipment. You can actually look at uh, personal protective equipment and it even breaks it down into different types of lists and searches. Let's see what we've got here. We've got everything from construction to healthcare. Uh, let's see, let's go ahead and get us a welding. And we've got our welding, all right, here we go. Here's a great little, let's do a search. Let's filter this so we get a little bit larger images. Let's go to size, large, all right. So this looks like it's okay. All right, so our PPE in terms of our personal protective equipment, looks like actually that's not a welder now, hang on. Ooh, let's start off with the helmet. So, some interesting little things about this. Obviously, we've got our safety plate for not for being able to have visualization without actually having the filter on. You know, shell, design, logos, all that good stuff. Uh, reinforced edge, friction joint, this amounts for your head adjustment. The free floating headgear, so you can just obviously rotate around this point, but hold on to your head or hat. Safety plate, as we mentioned, and then of course the filter holder. Now, you notice that the grade of filter does depend on what type of process you anticipate using. Now the cool ones nowadays have the, uh, the uh, instant flashing component to them which is really really cool. So typical he helmet. And obviously we can see some of our equipment right here. Got our helmet, got our, looks like it's got an extra cap over top of that so nothing get behind. Protective gear right here, non-flammable, good gloves, the only thing in question, of course, is exposed skin here. Normally, these the idea is to get to get this cover up occurring right here, so you don't have exposed skin in any of your scenarios. But you know, we're seeing some tank welding. 
and looks like he's even using a little bit of a shield for himself or maybe an armrest in that case, which is a good idea. Now this is an example of some of the respirators. Now obviously this would not work well with a welding helmet, but a respirator system typically wants to cover around your face so that you're not breathing in any of the fumes. I've not actually seen them used in welding process. I've never been in a toxic fume place where we're doing a lot of that. Mostly, normally ventilation takes care of everything that we need, but there's no doubt that there are some applications where we're going to, have to do this. Well, I guess you could look at the fact that if anybody does underwater welding, they're going to be something similar to this because they're going to have to wear a scuba gear. Now this provides a good little demonstration in terms of our ideal uh, ventilation. Notice that in this particular scenario, we've got all the same gear on. We've got, you know, the, the helmet, the apron, the gloves, the gear, non-flammable, safety shoes, leggings, whatever the case may be. Uh, the welding, of course, going on here. But this is really a good point is the actual exhaust system. So uh, as we said, we want ventilation to be doing this. Now these type of ventilation systems are really handy because they basically come over top of the weld station and take the fumes immediately from this point on out. Not a blowing this way or a blowing this way factor and they're easy to adjust and place specifically uh, over the spot in question. So this is a pretty good setup obviously that they're using for a demonstration but you can at least get the idea of why the ventilation is so important. Now this type of scenario reduces, really reduces the amount of risk a person has of breathing in any kind of fumes in this scenario. This however would not be a good example because as you can see the ventilation is going right up into the individual's face. Now who knows what we're actually welding on and whether or not this is massively toxic or not but it is a little bit more of a risk. Now they're probably welding outside so the ventilation requirements are less but as you can see, you know, all those fumes coming straight up into the person's breathing zone, not the best scenario. Now, as you can see from the searches, there's a lot of information out there. Your companies will specify what you have to have, but as you can see, there are some minimum requirements for just about any welding application. Um, one of the major differences is, you know, if you're using, if you're actually using some type of um, arc welding versus abrasing, that affects what type of, you know, helmet or mask you might be wearing. But, uh, and also toxic fumes versus a respirator, or having a respirator versus not. But you can always find out. The internet is available out there for you to pull down all kinds of great information all the time, and uh, it's always at your disposal. Just never underestimate the significance of safety, not only for your personal well being, obviously, but for your companies. And like I say, in terms of decision making, if an employee is not abiding by the safety rules, it's a lot. A lot more cost savings for them to go ahead and fire that employee and replace them than it is to deal with potential accidents that may occur for that employee's negligence. So, um, and they'll do it in a heartbeat too, especially with larger companies with, um, you know, big, big liabilities at stake. They're, they're very, very, very strict on the safety protocols. So you must abide by them um, to have a successful career. All right. Good stopping point. We'll see you on the next one.